Okay, so I'm going to go back here and focus on the math now for a second. I just have been emphasizing how uh, the force that an individual side is exerting is proportional to the difference between the membrane potential and this uh, driving potential. And that is literally expressed right here in this equation. The current I is equal to the conductance, how big the pipes are, how much kind of current is able to flow at maximum, okay, um, times this potential difference, the difference between the current membrane potential and the reversal or driving potential for a particular side inhibition versus excitation. And so as you can see, if this membrane potential happens to be exactly at E, E minus E equals zero, and there is no current and no force or current is being exerted. Um, and then as, as the membrane potential goes up away from E, you can just see that linearly, proportionally, you're gonna get more and more current, okay? More and more force, and the current really is effectively like the force at the, in the electrical system, at least metaphorically. So it's really a very simple equation, just very simple math, you know, multiplication, subtraction, nothing, nothing complicated here, and it tells us exactly this picture that we've been looking at. Uh, the other thing that I forgot to mention before is that there is this special point on this playing field the threshold. We label it with the letter theta, and when the membrane potential gets above that threshold, that's when the neuron fires, right? And so if we think about the starting point, typically is down t more towards the low end of the scale, and then as the c cell starts to get more excitation coming in, again, going back to our detector example, those synaptic inputs are the source of the excitation, and as that excitation starts coming in from the digit eight, for example, if we see an eight and we get a lot of excitation rushing in, that GE excitation builds up, that starts pulling that membrane potential up, 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 up towards this threshold. And once it gets above the threshold, then the neuron fires action potentials and signals to other neurons, hey, I found something, I've discovered something, something's happening here, I've detected something important, you listen to me. Okay, so if we put this together into a full set of equations, the overall net current is just the sum of the individual currents. And so far we've been focusing on two currents, the inhibition current versus the excitation current. There's actually a third current called the leak current, but the leak really is a doppelganger, a twin of the inhibition. It sits on the same side of the playing field. It's like the inhibition has two players, pulling against the one poor excitation that only has one player. And so what that means is that the equilibrium or driving potential, the reversal potential, those are all different words for the same thing. The reason we call this also the reversal potential is that if the membrane potential were to go below that value, then the sign of the force would actually reverse. And so instead of pulling, our inhibitory guy would actually push and there's, this actually happens in real neurons in the basal ganglia, for example, and other brain areas where uh, certain channels have a reversal potential that is greater than the typical resting potential. And so they start out pushing, they actually end up being excitatory, pushing the cell up until it gets to that point, and then they start to pull back down. So you can see how you can get some pretty interesting, more complicated dynamics there. So a lot of times people call this the reversal potential for that reason the sign reverses, it's like a zero point, and the sign reverses on either side of that point for each of these different guys. Okay, back to this equation. So there's two players on the inhibitory side, one player on the excitatory side, um, and what we've done is we've just said that the net current is the sum of each of those individual currents, and then we've taken the expression for each of those, and we're writing as subscripts uh, the E for excitation, I for inhibition, and L for leak. Then uh, we update the membrane potential, okay? The flag location moves over time. It starts out where it was last time. So the current time membrane potential is equal to the membrane potential at the previous time step plus 
some time constant, which we write as dt, sort of a calculus type of thing, like a delta time factor, um, how quickly the thing can move at any one time step, um, times this overall net value. So that, again, the, the net really is like the force. I mean, the current is really the force. It's how much it's pushing the flag one way or the other. And we're just adding in our, our current value of current to the membrane potential. And um, this kind of resistance to change is actually due in large part to the capacitance of the cell. Um, and that gets a little bit more complicated. It becomes an RC circuit. Uh, the R being the resistance, which is the conductance, uh, again, as we said. And then C, capacitance, enters into uh, this rate constant. Um, but it's a little complicated to picture, like what is that capacitance, Why, what's going on? It's like a bunch of charges being attracted across the membrane. We don't need to get into that level of detail. It's just a kind of time constant that causes the system to move somewhat slowly, uh, more slowly than instantaneously, um, as in response to changes in the current. Okay, so this is literally the equation that we run. Here we've just substituted in to this uh, membrane potential update equation, uh, the expression that we have for the net current in terms of these individual factors, uh, again, subtracting the membrane potential from the uh, equilibrium or driving potential. And this is the master equation that we run over and over again in the model. Um, when we run that detector example, that's what the model is running. It's running that equation iteratively over time, just constantly. And this is what we think the brain is doing. Um, and again, it's one of the most simple kind of electrical systems uh, that you can make. And it, it had, goes by the name of the RC circuit. Uh, it's very, very simple, but it captures a lot of important properties, as we said, in terms of relative balance, not absolute coding. Um, this power of shunting inhibition, which acts, acts a bit like a division kind of operation. Those are really important features. I mentioned that we can take this equation that we just derived here and actually mathematically, and we show this in the textbook, if you're interested how to do that, you know, algebraically, it's just doing the algebra, shuffling the symbols around and solving for the membrane potential when the rate of change, in other words, the net current is zero. And that's when the, the membrane potential stops moving when this net current ends up being zero. And so that's the point at which kind of all these different forces come to rest. And the, the, the guys are still pulling really strongly, but there's no net movement because the forces have balanced out against each other. And that point, this equilibrium point, is literally just the ratio of how strong the GE is, how much excitation you're getting, relative to the total that you're getting from everybody else. So GE over the sum of all the conductances into the cell. And the same thing for each of the other terms. So GI over the sum of the same sum of all the other conductances. And then you're multiplying times kind of where those guys are pulling. So this is how strong is GE relatively, again, relatively speaking, this is the relative factor, the fact that it's a ratio times where is it pulling. And so it, hopefully that makes intuitive sense each one is pulling in proportion to what fraction of the total current that they are generating. Very sensible. We show also in the textbook that this is exactly what you would expect from a kind of Bayesian optimal way of uh, integrating these signals. Um, I'm not sure how much actual kind of value that provides in terms of understanding the system more deeply, but nevertheless, uh, it is, in some sense, an optimal way of integrating these signals. And if you like Bayesian math uh, or don't know Bayesian math and want to learn about it, it may be an interesting way to do that. So that's in an appendix in Chapter 2.